Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this glorious Sunday morning. Isn't it great to have the sun shining more than one day in a row? Yeah. Let's not get too excited, though, and forget that winter is not officially over yet, even though we're going to have some 60-degree days this week. This is fall spring. Try, to, try not to break out all your shorts and everything just yet. But the golf courses will be open soon, probably, right? Well, you know. The diehards are going to get out there as soon as they can, right, Alvina and Harry? <laughs> some, some announcements this morning. Um, reminder, we have a consistory meeting immediately after the service today. Uh, next week and the following week, we will be receiving our one great hour of sharing and week of compassion offerings. Um, you should have gotten something about that in the tidings, and then you'll be getting some more information next Sunday and the following Sunday in our worship services about that. We will be having a service of Tenebrae on, Mon on Monday, Thursday, April the 1st. Um, and we will be looking for some people to participate in that service by doing some various readings. Um, this morning, the flowers are in memory of Donna Kane, who passed away 31 years ago. Um, the flowers are given uh, with love from Henry and uh, Kathy. And something Nina and I were talking about this week at 
um, staff meeting is if you're comfortable responding to this, how many people have had, a, had at least one uh, dose of the vaccine so far? Okay, good, that's good to know. Um, I, just saw, I just saw in the Detroit uh, city announcement that, um, I didn't realize this, that all clergy are now eligible to receive the vaccine. And I still don't live in the city. I know. I don't know if that's gonna go beyond the city of Detroit or not, but you might check yeah, on that. I don't know if that's a state thing yet. Um, Sarah, did you have an announcement? Well, a couple of things. Uh, apropos of what you were saying, if you know someone who is eligible and at home, like homebound and for Dearborn and surrounding cities, the firemen will come to you. And as near as we can tell, every fireman is hot. So if you know somebody and you can facilitate that, you can also benefit from the hotness of the visitor. Yeah. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say is we seem to be picking up a few extraneous noises uh, on my computer. So if everyone would, you know, respond when you're supposed to respond loudly, but the rest of the time just. <laughs> Well, this is not a virus. This is us. The good news is, is that our system is working well, but the downside is, is that it's picking, it's doing so well, it's picking up extraneous noise um, as we, as we uh, fellowship with each other during the worship service. Let us stand and sing our opening hymn. Oh, wait, Charlie? Oh. Daylight right. savings time next Sunday. Spring ahead. Spring ahead or you'll be late for church. I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh -huh. um, in the back table, on the back table, is the red book. Uh, Kim has graciously let me take it. And so I can get some hours in. And plug through it. Make sure that you know your family's information is up to date. Or you know somebody else is hasn't been added to whatever their death or whatever. Um, next week, I hope I could have to make them, to be honest, but we'll have some uh, sheets that you can fill out and get to me or put in your office and uh, so I can get that caught up. Okay? Now, to give you an idea, right now the latest uh, entry I can find is 2018. So a little bit deeper. Thank you. A couple things. Um, one real quick announcement. I know there's some people, and this probably pertains way more to people who are watching us online, um, who are not comfortable with masks, feel like they're suffocating when they have to wear one. Um, I do have some clear face shields in my office, so if you'd like to come to church but you're not comfortable with the mask, let me know, and I will get you one of those face shields, and you can wear that. Now let us stand and sing our opening hymn. <laughs>
join me in our call to worship. Called by Christ, we gather as one. Blessed by God's wisdom, we gather to learn. Amazed by God's love, we gather to worship. And join me in a spirit of prayer with our invocation. God of glory and might, speak, speak to, to us with, with your wisdom, wisdom that, that we, we might, might truly hear you. Display your majesty, that we might truly see you. Transform the chaos of our lives with the clarity of your call, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Here ends the reading. Our second reading is from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of John, the second chapter, verses 13 through 22. Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. 
He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my fa father's house a marketplace. His, di <clears throat> His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will, raise you, will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of the Lord. Today, as our Lenten journey continues, as we journey to Jerusalem, to the cross of Christ's crucifixion, through that cross and to the glory of the resurrection, we find ourselves confronted by Paul to reckon even now with the meaning of the cross for we people of faith and that it is in and through the cross of Christ that we find God's wisdom and God's will for God's people. The cross has from the earliest days of the church been the primary symbol of the Christian faith. Though you may remember that it was actually the symbol of a fish, a fish that was also used as one of the earliest symbols of those who followed Christ. It was often the mark of a fish or the sign of a fish that was marked on the outside of a home to indicate where followers of Christ were gathering for worship. <clears throat> but the cross has been and is the preeminent symbol for all of us who follow Christ. I dare say that there is not a church anywhere, anywhere, that does not have a cross or two or many around prominently displayed, both inside and outside their worship space. Many people wear a cross around their neck all the time, sometimes beneath their clothes and sometimes outside for all to see. I, like many ministers I know, have a collection of crosses, some simple, some quite ornate. My parents did a lot of traveling in their retirement years, and they always brought me a cross from wherever they had traveled, from their journey. I have crosses from Asia, from Ecuador, from Mexico, even one from the Holy Land. I always had them hanging in a prominent place in my office, or on my desk, or in some other place of honor surrounding me. I'm often struck at religious gatherings, particularly, particularly with other ministers who wear crosses when they go especially out in public. I sometimes wonder, now this might seem a bit judgy, I sometimes wonder though if some of those folk don't carry two or three crosses in their pocket and walk in and read the room and see who has the biggest cross on <laughs> and then pull a bigger one out of their pocket to put on. Now, maybe that's just because I spent so many years in Texas, you know, and, you know, in Texas we have to do everything bigger. Does how big the cross is, what it looks like, how ornate it is, how many jewels are even on it, does any of that really matter? I'm reminded of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. How many of you have seen that movie? It's an oldie, 30 plus years ago that movie came out. And if you haven't seen it, I'm going to give away the plot so you'll know the end. Sorry. Indiana Jones and his father, who's played by Sean Connery, by the way, Indiana Jones and his father have been looking for the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail, the cup of Christ, the cup reported to be the cup 
that Jesus had used at the Last Supper. Jones's father, Sean Connery, has been shot towards the end of the movie. He's been shot as their quest unfolds, and they have been told that a drink of water from a well, from the cup, from the Holy Grail, will save his life. Harrison Ford has made his way into a chamber, into a chamber where there's a small pool of water, and there are chalices spread all around the pool on a table. Some are quite exquisite, some quite simple, but they're all there. Indiana Jones is told he gets one chance to pick the Holy Grail and get some water and take it to his father, and his father will live. One chance. Jones thinks, he talks about it for a minute, and then he says, the cup of Christ is surely a simple one, like this. And he picks up a very simple, plain chalice from the table. He fills it with some water, takes it to his father, who drinks it, and his father is immediately healed. He chose well. You see, friends, the wisdom of the cross is not about the wearing of it, but it's about the life of the one wearing it. Not about how big it is, how fancy it is, how ornate it is, but about how the power of the cross is reflected in one's life. About how it reflects the life-giving, life-loving way that Christ brought into this world. The wisdom of the cross, as Paul reminds us, is not the wisdom of the world. In fact, Paul says the cross of Christ is foolishness to the world, for it makes no sense to the world, and perhaps sometimes it doesn't even make sense to us. Yet it is in and through the cross of Christ that we know of God's absolute love and care for us and for all of creation. And we know and we trust this by faith. The power of the cross of Christ is inestimable, unfathomable, unknowable, incredible. I wonder what you feel when you look at the cross that we see every Sunday as we sit in worship. The crosses you may have in your home. The cross you may choose to wear around your neck or even carry in your pocket. How does the cross of Christ change or transform you? If we look at it long enough, take it seriously long enough, pray about it, walk with it and carry it long enough, then we will know that the wisdom of the cross does indeed change lives and changes the world. I share with you a story from Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nestled at the foot of a lofty mountain range in the northeastern part of the United States lay a beautiful, fertile valley. The people of the valley either lived in log farmhouses at the edge of the massive black forest or in the villages sprinkled along the clear stream that tumbled down from the mountains. To the west, in full view of the entire valley, a giant face was etched in the side of an enormous rock. It was as if a titan had sculpted his own likeness on the precipice. There was the broad arch of the forehead, a hundred feet in height, the nose with a long bridge, and the vast lips, which if they could have spoken would have thundered from one end of the valley to the other. Many believe that the serenity and fertility of the valley was in large part due to the great stone face that continually beamed across the land. In one of the log huts, a widow lived along with her son, Ernest. Daily the two gazed out their window up at the great stone face. Mother, Ernest said one day, if the face could speak, I am certain it would have a kindly voice. 
If an old prophecy should come to pass, the mother replied, we may yet hear the face speak one day. The mother then told her son of a legend passed down from the Indians who lived there, murmured by the mountain streams and whispered by the wind, that one day a child would be born in the valley who would grow to be a great and wise man bearing the exact likeness of the great stone face. She told how many had grown weary of waiting and no longer believed the legend. Others, however, held fast to it like a great promise. Ernest never forgot the story his mother told him that day. Seldom did a day pass when he did not go outside and look up at the face and think about the person who would come one day to the valley. Often at the end of a workday, he would gaze at the face for hours at a time. It gave him a sense of comfort and strength, for he saw honesty, love, and justice in the face, virtues he longed to experience. One day, Ernest heard a rumor that a man who had been born in the valley and who had made a great fortune was returning to spend his last years there in the place of his birth. It was said that the man bore a striking resemblance to the great stone face. His name was Gathergold. Now, I am not certain that this was his real name. Perhaps it was given to him because of his talent of amassing great wealth as a merchant and shipbuilder. What is certain is that his fame had spread around the entire world. Preparations for the arrival of Gathergold began to flourish. A famous architect came to help build a massive mansion made of white marble on the land where Gathergold's parents had once lived and farmed. Everything was custom designed. The finest craftsmen were hired, something that was unheard of in that tiny valley. Finally, Gather Gold himself arrived in a carriage drawn by four beautiful horses. A large crowd gathered for the occasion of his arrival. As the carriage came into view, a great murmur went up. Look, here he comes. He is the exact image of the great stone face. The prophecy has come true. As the crowd cheered, Ernest looked on in disbelief. Gathergold looked nothing like the figure he watched every evening of the great stone face. He had a low forehead, small sharp eyes, and thin lips. Ernest turned away sadly. As he walked home that evening, he looked up at the gentle countenance that beamed across the valley. And for a moment, he thought he heard the face say, He will come. He will come. Years passed and Ernest became a young man. Though he was hardworking and friendly, few knew him in town, for he was a quiet person. Though he had no formal education, he constantly read books. If you asked him, however, he would have told you that his favorite teacher was the great stone face. It was at this time that the hopes of the people of the valley were raised up once again. Another native son known as Old Blood and Thunder was returning to the valley to make it his home again. Those who knew the general were ready to testify that he had an uncanny resemblance to the great stone face. Plans were made for a great parade to welcome the military hero. Ernest and most of the people of the valley took the day off to watch the parade and cheer for their favored son. Reverend Battleblast began the festivities with a prayer. Our Father, we give you humble thanks for the great blessings you have so graciously bestowed on this valley. We ask a special blessing on this great man of peace in whose honor we are gathered. As the general stepped forward, Ernest was blocked by the swirling crowd. Not being the least bit pushy, he waited until the crowd had parted before he moved forward to view the great man. Ernest was amazed. Old blood and thunder looked nothing like the great stone face. Despite the voices in the crowd that declared, he is the image of the faith, of the face, the prophecy has been fulfilled. As the general spoke, Ernest was even more convinced that the hopes of the people were ill-placed. This is no man of peace like the great stone face, Ernest thought. Ernest failed to identify the gentle wisdom and tender sympathy that he had come to associate with his stone teacher in old blood and thunder. This is not the man of prophecy, Ernest sighed as he walked home. 
The years sped by swiftly and tranquilly. Ernest was now a man in his middle years. He had gained a reputation among the people of the valley as a simple-hearted man of great wisdom. Seldom did a day pass when neighbors did not come to him for advice. People began to recognize in him something more than an ordinary man. By this time, people had become disillusioned with old blood and thunder, and now awaited another who would fulfill the prophecy. Soon their hopes were placed on a noted politician who had been born in the valley, a man no, known as Old Stony Fizz. I need not tell you much about him except to say that it was clear in the beginning to Ernest that this was not the one who had the moral character of the great stone face. The years moved on and Ernest grew old. His hair was as white as snow and wrinkles crossed his forehead and furrowed his cheeks. Time had also engraved deep wisdom in him. Many came from beyond the valley to talk and to listen to him. People said, his knowledge does not come from books. He has talked with angels. To each of his visitors, Ernest shared his hope that during his lifetime, the great stone face would again appear as the prophecy said. One day, a great poet came to visit. He was a celebrated man who had heard of the wisdom of this gentle man of the valley. The poet was one whose words sparkled with the divine, whose words were acclaimed throughout the land. Ernest had in fact read his poems and they had stirred his soul. The day the poet arrived, Ernest was reading of the writer's, one of the writer's books. Good evening, sir. Can you give a traveler a night's lodging, asked the poet. Gladly, answered Ernest, who then added, I don't think I have ever seen the great stone face looked so hospitably at a stranger. The two men were quickly engaged in conversation and were equally impressed with each other. Finally, Ernest said, who are you, my gifted friend? Placing his finger on the volume Ernest had been reading, he replied, I am the author of these poems. Quickly, Ernest searched the face of the poet before gazing sadly at the great stone face. Why are you so downcast, my wise friend, asked the poet. All my life I have waited for the fulfillment of a prophecy. And when I read your poems, I hoped that it might be fulfilled in you. You are now disappointed as you were with Gathergold, Old Blood and Thunder, and Old Stony Fizz. Yes, Ernest, you must add my name to your illustrious three for I am not worthy of that great name. Why not? Your words have a divine ring, Ernest pleaded. Perhaps, replied the poet, perhaps there is a far off echo of a divine song in my writing, but my life has not been so sweet. I have lived in a manner of which I am not proud. His voice trailed off. The poet and Ernest sat together in long silence for a long time. After the hour of sunset, as was his custom in those later years, Ernest went to talk with a group of people in a small, pleasant nook in the mountains. Ernest normally stood on a small elevation while the others sat or reclined on the grass. Off in the distance, the great stone face watched. Ernest began to speak, telling people what was on his mind and heart. His words and power, for they were based on experience and harmonized with the life he had always lived. Never, thought the poet, his eyes glistening with tears, have I wit witnessed a man as powerful as this. As he listened, the poet looked off in the distance at the great stone face. Suddenly he threw his arms in the air. Behold, behold, the great stone face. He has come, the poet shouted. Ernest whirled and saw that the poet was looking at him. The poet said, Ernest is himself the likeness of the great stone face. All the people looked first at Ernest and then at the mountain and saw that what the poet said was true. The great stone face was in fact in their midst, a man of integrity and love. And so it came to pass, a man born in the valley had grown to be a great and wise man bearing the exact likeness of the great stone face.
He was a man of peace and justice and love. The prophecy had been fulfilled. So it is with the power of the cross of Christ, my friends, that others may see and know the Christ through you and you and me and through all who call upon his name. Take up the cross, for there you will find the very wisdom of God, the wisdom of God's will for you and for all of us as God's people and for all the world. Gaze upon the cross. Let it be in you. Let it speak to you. May your journey that continues through Lent be blessed. May you stay safe, strong, and of good courage in the living and the facing of these and all of our days. Go with God. Amen. Let us join together in our prayer. Thank you, God, for your many blessings to us. Accept now our tithes and offerings and use us and our gifts for your kingdom. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As nine is coming, let's, let us also remember in our prayers today the historic event that's happening in Iraq, with, or in Iran, I mean, with, um, um, in, in Iraq, uh, with the Pope's visit. Let's pray that that continues to go well and that everyone involved continues to be safe. It is truly a historic event. Okay, um, let's remember Barb Armento who is having some concerns about where she's going to be living. Uh, Joy is from Sarah, that they were able to get their vaccinations, yay. Uh, prayers for Julia, thankful for her visit, and Bob will be coming soon, so prayers for his safe travel. Um, prayers of Joy for Phyllis's daughter Amy and granddaughter Ariel, who are celebrating birthdays. And prayer for nine month old Elliot, who fell, but he's doing okay. All right. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come to you to share our joys, knowing that you celebrate with us. As we mark the passage of time and celebrate for one more birthday, we are grateful. Gracious God, we know that many are the concerns we have in our day-to-day -day life where we will live, how we will meet our bills, perhaps how we will make sure we have enough to eat. And we pray for all those who face these challenges each and every day. Gracious God, we thank you for caring for young Elliot who is recovering from his fall. 
We pray that you will continue to touch him and keep him safe as he grows. Loving God, for those who, are, who will be on the road and traveling, we ask that you keep them safe, bring them to their destination, give them the energy required to make the journey. We ask these things in the name of your beloved child. And Lord, as we continue on our Lenten journey, we ask for strength and wisdom. As we consider the time that Jesus spent alone in the desert, fasting and praying, be with us also as we travel through our own personal deserts. As we journey on our way, be with us and guide us. Lord, we continue to remember Marge and Jill and ask for your comfort and your healing. For those who are grieving, we ask, Lord, for your loving arms to wrap around them. So many families and friends who have lost loved ones during this pandemic. Each and every one important in the lives of those around them. Lord, remind them that they are not alone that they have not been abandoned, that the love from their people goes with them wherever they are. And now, gracious God, hear these, the silent prayers of your people, prayers to which we cannot give words, but which live in our hearts. Hear now the words of the prayer that your child gave to us through his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we do each week, we come now to that special time in our worship service when we remember that it was at the end of his life that Jesus was gathered for a meal with his disciples and friends. During that meal, he took some bread from the table and he blessed it and he offered it to them to eat, saying, this is my body which is broken and given for you. As often as you eat of this bread, do this in remembrance of me. In a similar manner, after their meal, he took a cup. Again, he blessed it and then he gave it to them to drink and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God given for we, the people of God. Let us partake.
Go in the peace of Christ, in the wisdom of the cross, knowing that what others see as foolishness, we know is the blessing of God. Go in peace. Amen. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you. We just can't keep those candles lit up there, can we? This is crazy.